Hello everybody and welcome to another Bentley Davy Tudors video. Obviously it's just me here today, which will be the case for a couple of our other videos throughout this exam block because we were incredibly unprepared um, and did not find the time to film together. But that's all right, we're still gonna get the content out to you as uh, bad as it might be. I mean, I'm sure the videos with just me will be far better than the ones that you have to watch with me and Luke, where it's just me actually teaching you stuff and, make, and, and Luke making a joke that's not funny every couple of minutes. Uh, but today we will be talking about chemistry. Uh, essentially, I'm going to go through all of the syllabus points to do with the Year 10 chemistry unit uh, and pretty much cover off any, everything that you'd need to know. Um, so I will go through them in order, um, sort of if you want to take study notes along with this, which we always think is a good idea. Just watching the video probably won't be enough to get everything into your brain, uh, but it also can be a good refresher if you think you already know what you're doing. So I will go through them now. So our first point is discuss how the model of an atom's structure has changed over the last 2,000 years. I'm not really sure where it's getting 2,000 years from, uh, but I've got the actual important timeline that you need to know, which is only about 200 years. Um, so in 1803, I'll put maybe a little picture thing up here that's got a uh, good little description of this, although the text is quite small, so you probably can't even read it. Um, but basically, in 1803, John Dalton decided that uh, we now have the solid sphere model. This was the first sort of model of the atom. Um, and he works out that the atoms of every element are the same, and he believes that atoms at this point are indivisible. In 1904, however, J.J. Thompson does a bit better with his plum pudding model. He discovers electrons uh, and thought that they essentially just floated around the atom. In 1911, Ernest Rutherford gives us the nuclear model. And Rutherford, basically, he's the one uh, who fired the alpha particles into a thin sheet of gold and found that most of them went through, but some of them bounced off. Uh, and this meant that, the, that an atom must be mostly empty space, but with a positive charge focused in the centre. Then in 1913, Niels Bohr gave us the Bohr diagram and put electrons uh, around the nucleus in rings. And in 1926, Schrödinger decides that shells are too nice uh, and, and the rings for electrons are too nice, and so he decides that electrons now move in waves. And it is impossible to know where electrons are at any moment uh, in time, and so instead we just sort of have a cloud of waves where they could be. So that's the um, timeline that you need to know in terms of um, the structure of an atom. It's not that interesting, but it's something that they often ask you about as a little one marker at the start or something in maybe multi-choice. So the next point here is describe the features and locations of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Again, this is pretty basic stuff covered, covered pretty much every year. But basically, we've got protons are in the nucleus and they're positively charged. Neutrons are also in the nucleus, but are neutrally charged, which means that they don't have any charge, positive or negative. And then electrons are on the outside uh, of the nucleus and they are negatively charged. Next, we've got distinguish between atomic mass and atomic number. Atomic number is the number of protons inside the nucleus of an atom, whereas um, atomic mass is the sum of the mass of the protons and neutrons, uh, and is typically uh, inside of an atom, and is typically not far off being double the atomic number. In terms of atomic mass, there's also some special things where the actual number will be, will be point something, 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 which is to do with um, the average of all the isotopes, but that's not that important. Um, and so basically, the atomic number is the little number below everything on the periodic table, as in hydrogen is 1 and helium is 2, whereas atomic mass might be below that and will normally be about double the atomic number, but not always. Right, uh, so the next thing is use Bohr diagrams to describe the way in which electrons are arranged uh, in the nucleus. All we need to know at this point is that they go 2 in the first ring, then 8 in the second, then 8 in the third, and so on. That's not how it actually works. How it actually works is um, with the formula 2n squared, with n being the number of the ring. Um, so the first ring would be 2 times 1 squared, which is 2 times 1, which is 2. Then we've got 2 times 2 squared, which is 2 times 4, which is 8. Then it would be 2 times 3 squared, uh, which would be 18. But that's not how we do it here. Uh, and instead, we just go 2, 8, 8, 8, 8, which is fine. Um, okay, so then we have rec recall the names of specific families of elements and their locations on the periodic table. So the families here are quite important, um, but only a couple of them we actually care about. So firstly, we've got alkali metals. These are the first column or group one elements, so they're the ones on the far left, and they are highly reactive, um, which you will understand more later. Uh, then we have alkali earth metals. This is the second column, sometimes just called alkali earths. Uh, and they are also reactive, but a bit less. So they're in the second column in from the left. Then we've got the halogens. This is group 7 or 17, whichever you like. 
and it's the second group in from the right. So not the far right, the one to the left of the far right. I'm not making that confusing at all. Then we've got the noble gases, and this is group 8 or 18, and they're the far right. They're cool because they have full outer shells, and therefore they are stable, uh, and so they're very non-reactive. It's very hard to make a noble gas react with anything. So the next thing is explain how ions are formed and named. Ions, uh, these are not fun. Okay, so basically an ion is a normal atom that has changed its electron structure to bond with something else. Ions can either be cations when they are positively charged or be anions when they are negatively charged. I have just made a major mistake, uh, which presumably I will edit out, but we're just going to ignore everything that I just said. Right, so ions can either be positively charged, uh, sorry, so ions can either be cations where they're positively charged or be anions where they're negatively charged. For example, sodium is written, the sodium ion is written as Na+, uh, which makes it a positively charged cation as it gets uh, an electron, making it, no, as it, uh, as it loses an electron, uh, an electron, which is negative, making it a cation and positively charged. Uh, and uh, and oxygen is two minus, making it a negative cation because it wants to get two more electrons, which are negatively charged, which would make it a negatively charged anion. If I have made a mistake with my words there, uh, which I probably have because I wrote this thing wrong, anion is negative, which would be something written such as minus or two minus or three minus or whatever. Cation is positive, which would be plus, two plus, three plus, whatever. Right, explain how ionic compounds are formed uh, and named and be able to write their chemical formulae, including polyatomics. It says that, but then it says a periodic table and polyatomic sheet will be provided in the examination, which is like, well, why do you need us to know it then? Anyway, an ionic compound is basically formed between a metal and a non-metal. And basically what happens is you're trying to get it to be balanced and neutrally charged. Using those ones from before to bond sodium with oxygen, we're trying to get them both uh, to be stable. So as we said before, sodium is one plus, which means it needs to get rid of one electron um, to be like its closest noble gas, which is helium. If you look at a periodic table, you've got sodium on this side and then the row above over on the other side is helium. So it needs to get rid of one electron to look like helium. Um, whereas oxygen needs to get two to be, it needs to get two electrons to be like its closest noble gas. So if sodium gives one and oxygen needs two, then if we just get two sodiums, then we'll have enough. So that gives us the compound Na2O, which is basically two Na's or two sodiums and one O, which is, which is oxygen. So the next point here is explain how covalent compounds are named and be able to write their chemical formulae. So covalent compounds are a bit different and apparently we don't need to know how they form, uh, but they're done in a fairly similar way. They are when a non-metal reacts with another non-metal, and basically the naming stuff for this is mono uh, is one, di is for two, tri is for three, tetra is for four, and penta is for five. So if we had three nitrogens and four oxygens, we would get trinitrogen tetroxide. The one important thing to remember here is that if the thing that you've got the prefix in front of starts with a vowel, then you can leave the vowel off of the prefix. For example, it's tetroxide, not tetraoxide. So uh, then we've got distinguished between reactants and products. This one's pretty easy. Uh, basically, reactants are just the things that go into the equation, and then a product is what comes out. So the next syllabus point is write word equations to describe common reactions between chemicals. Uh, this is an easy skill as long as you can work out um, what has come out of each side, but essentially you just write the words out on both sides of the uh, equation. So the next one is write balanced chemical equations using chemical formulae to describe important chemical reactions between substances. This skill is much harder to do and it's something that needs lots and lots of practice, but essentially when you're balancing an equation, all you're looking for is the same number of atoms of everything on both sides. So if you have six carbons on one side, you need to have six carbons on the other. So if you've got, uh, I don't know, what's something that exists? If you've got um, hydrochloric acid on one side and you react it with, uh, I'm making this up on the spot, so this is probably going to be wrong. Uh, but if you've got hydrochloric uh, acid on one side and you react it with carbon, uh, copper carbonate also on that side, what you're going to end up with, this is a special, this is an acid plus carbonate reaction. But essentially what you're going to um, end up with is you'll get uh, copper, you'll get 
copper chloride, which is the your copper from one side, and then your chloride from that side as well. So you'll get copper chloride, and then you'll get H2O, which is just water, uh, and then you will get CO2. So what actually, uh, thinking about it now, what you'll actually need to do is you'll need to get uh, two HCLs to balance it out. Um, but essentially, you're just trying to make sure that you've got the same number of everything on both sides. That's just how you've got to have it um, so that it can work. Now, I'm just going to quickly take a quick break and work out uh, that equation that I just said, and I'll get back to you very shortly. Right, I've worked it out. How it works, you've got HCl uh, plus copper carbonate, which is CuCO3 on one side, uh, and then on the other side, you'll get CuCl2 plus H2O plus CO2. But that actually doesn't work because that means that on one side, I've only got one chloride, and on the other side, I've got two. So what you do is you whack a two in front of the HCl, and then it all works and is all balanced. Right, so the next thing is uh, here is recall the law of the conservation of mass or, or matter. And essentially the idea here is that uh, uh, this law states that matter cannot be created or destroyed and therefore all matter that enters a chemical uh, reaction will come out on the other side. So next is identify features of an acid and base, explain the use of the pH scale and the use of the universal indicator when dealing with acids and bases. So basically an acid is a substance that produces hydrogen ions, which are H+, uh, which then form with water, uh, being H2O, to make a hydronium ion, which is H3O. Whereas uh, a base is something that produces hydroxide ions, which are OH-, uh, and basically acids and bases are on opposite ends of the pH scale, which uh, is a, pre a nice, pretty colourful chart with numbers on it, um, and a universal indicator can be added to a solution and then you look at the colour of the solution and you match that with the chart to identify its pH. Our next point here is describe the reactants and the products um, and understand how to apply the general equations in a variety of reactions. So we have seven of these reactions to remember, which is just excellent. Um, so firstly, we've got combustion with oxygen. Uh, this one just makes uh, common oxides such as copper oxide or iron oxide. Next one, this is the nice one to remember, is uh, acid plus base, just makes salt plus water. And a salt is basically just a substance that isn't an acid or a base. And so that's called a neutralization reaction. Then we've got a carbonate plus acid, which is the one that I did before. Uh, so this makes, so a carbonate is anything with CO3 on the end. Um, but when mixed uh, with an acid, they produce a salt, again, plus CO2 plus H2O. So then we've got carbonate heated, makes common oxides again, uh, as well as CO2. Now, if we think about this, this happens because when you've got CO3 for carbonate, uh, you're left with the CO2 when it's split up. You're left, so you've, sorry, I'll explain this better. When you've got CO3 and then it gets split up, you've got a CO2 over there, and then you've still got one O left being an oxygen, and then that's still left with the metal, which just makes it an oxide. So that's how that works. Then the fifth one is two dissolved ionic solutions, uh, which makes a precipitate as per the solubility tables, which you will always be given. Then we've got acid plus reactive metal makes salt plus hydrogen, and acid plus a metal oxide makes salt plus water. So our second to last dot point here is describe the reactants and products for a corrosion reaction and recall the word equation. Now, I don't actually think any classes have really learned this, but it was one of the outcomes. Uh, so I did some extra reading for you all. Uh, and essentially, the cor corrosion reaction is when you've got a metal plus oxygen gas plus water, which makes a metal hydroxide, which is essentially just corrosion. And our final point today is explain how the formation of a precipitate as a result of a chemical reaction may be predicted. A precipitate is the re result of a chemical reaction uh, that is where the substance produced is insoluble in water and can predi be predicted through the use of a solubility table. Or it might say something like, all carbonates are soluble except X, and then if you have an X carbonate, then it will not be soluble and therefore it will make a precipitate. So that is all of the dot points uh, for the chemistry um, section of our science units this year. Hope you've enjoyed and hopefully learnt something, uh, make sure that you practice writing those word and chemical, chemical equations because those can be some of the hardest things to do uh, and the skills that everybody struggles the most with. Um, we will have lots more videos coming out in the next couple of days because we're going into an exam block. Um, and so, I don't know, yeah, leave a like and subscribe, I guess, if you enjoyed uh, and watch out for them. Thank you and goodbye.